I invite you to take out a Bible, open it up to Psalm 23. As we've been going through this beloved poem for the last several weeks, we conclude today by looking at verse 6. And the whole purpose of going through Psalm 23 is, yes, I know you're most likely very familiar with it. Many of you probably have it memorized, but it is a beautiful reminder to us of who our Savior, who our Jesus is. And in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus asked his apostles, his disciples, the question of of who do people say that I am? But then he moves and asks them the personal question of who do you say that I am? And that's been the theme of this series as we've been studying Psalm 23 is answering the question for ourselves of who Jesus is. Because the reality of life is that you and I need to be able to get that answer right. You and I, for our own comfort, our own hope, our own salvation, need to know who Jesus is. And then, in order to be obedient to Jesus and to share that good news of who he is and his love for the world with the people around us, we also need to be able to tell them, here's who Jesus is. What I love about that story of Jesus and the disciples is that when he asked them, who do people say that I am, is that they give all kinds of answers to the question of who Jesus is, that he's a prophet, he's a miracle worker, he's a wonderful teacher, right? All these things. And the reality is that today, if you ask people on the street, who is Jesus or or what do you know about Jesus, you're, you're gonna get fairly similar answers, right? 2,000 years later, we really haven't like changed the answers that a lot of people give. But ultimately, the answer that matters is the one that Peter gives when he says that, that you're the Christ, you're the Savior, you're the Son of God. That's the answer that you and I need to believe in, but it's also the answer that the, that the world needs because people in the world, people in your workplaces, people in your families, people in your houses need the comfort of knowing who Jesus is. And so in Psalm 23, the very first line gives a wonderful answer and summary is that he is the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And in and, and John, Jesus even says, I am the good shepherd who has come to give life to the sheep. And so in verse 2, Psalm 23, we see that he gives us what we need for life. In verse 4, he gives us comfort that we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death or darkness, which sometimes that's where we're at, right? And we talked about last week that sometimes we feel like the valley's never going to end, but the good news and the comfort of Jesus is that he's a shepherd who walks with his sheep through all of life circumstances. So whether you're feeling really great and on a mountaintop experience in life because everything is lining up for you, or you're just curious how deep a valley it can get, the good news of Jesus is he's a shepherd who is with us. And then in verse five it says, you prepare a table for me before my enemies. And that sounds really nice, doesn't it? The first time you're like, oh, Jesus is making a table. We're gonna have a dinner party with him. This is gonna be great. And then there's that line where it says, before my enemies. You're like, that doesn't sound so great. Like, how many of you, if you're throwing a dinner party, are like, I got a list of people I want to invite. And then there's a list of people you don't want to invite. Anybody have two lists? No? Wow. Okay, so I'm the jerk and you're all wonderful, kind people. That's great. All right. <laughs> Anybody, when we were growing up in school and there was like the, the classroom birthday parties, right? And you are forced by your parents to invite that kid? Come on, y'all. Like, right, someone had to do this too, right? <laughs> you just, you're like, why is he here? Oh, my mom made me take him and bring him. It's, it's fine, all right? Here's the reality. <laughs> Beyond birthday parties and dinner parties, there's enemies in life, Right? There's critics, there's people that hurt you, insult you, maybe they hurt or insult or attack people you love. And here's the reality, there's there's these people in life, you're like, I don't want to be at the table with them. But Jesus is doing this when he says he's anointed by heaven, he's doing it in order to give us 
victory and ultimately the victory over the greatest enemies of sin and death and the devil. He's saying, look, I'm, I'm preparing this table so you can celebrate that I've given you victory over them. And then we get to verse 6, which is kind of the concluding beautiful promise of what our shepherd Jesus does for us. And so I'll just read it because I'm going to give you a second translation in a moment. And I know some of you are going to get very upset with me because how many of you love Psalm 23? And you're like, don't mess with it. Well, for, for your entertainment this morning, we're going to mess with it. All right. Verse six, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, I love this line. I love this, this promise and this assurance of here's who Jesus is. This is what he does. He is the shepherd who has come to give you and me mercy in this life and to give us the promise of eternal life. So you have to see how Psalm 23 works. It's describing that Jesus is our shepherd who, who gives us what we need for this life. He, he gives us victory over our enemies of sin and death and the devil. He is with us when we're in the valley of the shadow of death. He is with us when we're facing evil. And at the end of the day, here's the goodness and the promise of God. Is that despite all those things that are going on, he gives you and me the mercy that we need in life. And he gives you and me the promise of eternal life. All right, so it's kind of like... Here's all these things. There's the valley, right? There's evil, there's enemies. And then David is saying at the end, and here's the big promise so that overcomes all those things. Jesus the shepherd gives me mercy in the midst of them. And when I am facing evil, when I am facing the valley of darkness, when I am facing death itself, he gives me the promise of eternal life. He's going to be with me, not just in the valley, but for all eternity. So what I want to do this morning is I want to teach you a few Hebrew words. You're not going to remember them, but I want to teach you what they mean in English so you can remember that part, okay? All right, here's the first word of verse 6 says, surely. The Hebrew word there is the word ak. It mean, it's A-K, all right? And it can, it's how you spell it. And it can mean surely or only or but. And it's kind of just this gut reaction. Right? Anybody ever sighed before? Like really sighed. Like I don't just mean like, ah, but like, like your soul is just like kind of grumbling at what life is throwing at you. Right? And this is what David is doing. He, he's, he's sighing. He's kind of going, ah. Right? That's what the word act even kind of sounds like, right? You're kind of just disgusted, right? You're kind of, anybody ever been fed up with circumstances? So he's saying, look, look, Psalm 23 says some wonderful promises, right? But it also says some hard realities of life. There's a valley, there's evil, there's death, there's enemies, right? Like how many of you are like, yeah, praise God for those. Right? No, those are things where we look at and we're just wondering, okay, well, what's next? And sometimes life gets to the point where you're wondering and I'm wondering, okay, like when's the next bad thing going to happen? When's the next thing that's going to go wrong, right? And we just want to sigh or you just look at the circumstances and you just want to scream out, ah, right? You're just, you're just grossed out by it. You're, you're tired of it. You're disgusted and your soul just wants to just kind of throw up, right? It's like, I'm done with this. But here's the wonderful point of this word, is that most commonly it's translated as the word but, and meaning like there's this interruption, right? So David is saying, look, here's the reality of life that you and I face in this sinful world. There is a valley of darkness that we get stuck in sometimes, that we have to walk through. There is evil in the world, right? Meaning there is brokenness. There are things in our lives and in the world where it's not going the way it should or that we wish it would. And he's saying there's even enemies. And now we know there's critics and there's people we don't like that sin against us and hurt against us. But we also know what the scripture says that there's a, there's a bigger enemy of sin and death and the devil. 
And you're like, oh my gosh, like, that does not sound like good news, right? <laughs> like, right? Most of you probably didn't need David in Psalm 23 to point all of that out to you, right? How many of you are well aware that there's a valley in life sometimes, right? And this is the word ak comes at you at the end of verse 6. He says, but, right, there's this interruption of like, there's a valley, there's darkness, there's evil, there's any, and then David is basically shouting, ach, but here's the promise of the shepherd. Despite all that, in the midst of all that, here is what is reality in my life. Goodness and mercy follow me. And all the days of my life, I'm going to dwell with the Lord. So here's why I love scripture so much. It acknowledges the reality of life. It doesn't sugarcoat it, right? It just says, yeah, sometimes your, your whole soul, your whole being is just going on. The shout out, ack. You're just going to want to sigh. You're just going to be like annoyed by it. But it's also a sigh that gives us hope and comfort in the middle of it. Because what is David holding on to? He's saying, yeah, that's all true. Those are the realities of life sometimes. But despite all that, here's the goodness and the promise of our shepherd, Jesus, that, that he's going to bring goodness and mercy into your life. And despite there being a valley of shadow of death, he's going to conquer it and give you eternal life. You're going to dwell with him forever. So that's the first word. We're, we're going to go very slowly. Right? The next word, goodness. And then there's this word, mercy. Now, the Hebrew word for mercy is one of the most popular words in the Old Testament, most common words in the Old Testament. It's the word chesed. If you're really into taking notes, it's H-E-S-E-D, H-E-S-E-D, the word chesed. And it gets translated all kinds of different ways. It's this really big, all-encompassing word trying to, it's a word that is trying to summarize how big God's love is. You're like, that's hard to do. You're like, yeah, it is. Right, so sometimes it's translated as mercy, sometimes it's translated as grace. The most common way to translate it is steadfast love. And so what David is saying here is, yeah, despite, right, ach, all the stuff of life, here's what's following me. Here's what Jesus, the good shepherd, is bringing into your life through his love for you. Goodness and steadfast love. And I, I, I love that translation of the word chesed because it's this reminder that it's not inconsistent love, right? It, it's not sometimes there and then sometimes not. It's, it's not a love that is dependent about how I'm feeling or how I'm doing or how good I'm behaving. It's not dependent on if I'm on the mountaintop or at the bottom of the valley. It's just saying, no, no, it's a steadfast consistent love. And so when the authors of the Old Testament are trying to summarize God's love, the best word they could come up with is chesed. It's mercy. It's grace. It's steadfast. It's consistent. Meaning David is saying, here's the reality of God's love for you. It's always there. It is always for you. He's never taking it back. He's never pulling a little bit of it away or withholding any of it. He's always saying, no, here it is. Every step that you take in the valley of the shadow of death and darkness and hardship of life, he's saying, God's love is with you because the shepherd Jesus is with you. So David says, but goodness and steadfast love will follow me, shall follow me. Now the word follow me, I told you I'm teaching a lot, okay, is radup, all right, R-A-D-U-P, radup. And it's a hunting term, and it's a military term. And it's used in the context of hunting or military pursuit to say, we are hunting down our prey, or we are hunting down our enemies to overtake them. So here's why this matters so much. When it says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. If you're having a really bad time, 
right? If you find yourself in the valley, if you find yourself struggling with enemies, you find yourself feeling a little overwhelmed with the evils of the world, and then you hear a promise, well, it's following you, guess what you're gonna think? Well, how far back is it, right? Because you're like, I'm stuck here in the valley. I feel like I'm surrounded by darkness and and hurt and it's not going the right way. And and then you get this promise that says, well, goodness and mercy are following you, right? It almost sounds like it's on its way. And then guess what you're going to want to shout out? (laughs) Ah, (laughs) you're going to want to shout out, well, when's it getting here? Right? Did it get lost? Anybody ever track your packages like you have OCD? Right? You're like, it's... It's on its way, okay, right? And it's giving you updates, 10 stops. Who else in my neighborhood is ordering stuff? How could it possibly get here now, right? It's following you. (laughs) Like, well, how many stops away is it? And here's the reality. If maybe you're struggling, not just with circumstances happening to you, how many of you are willing to admit you're not perfect and you make some of your own problems? Right? You say, it's following me. Yeah, but I don't deserve it because I, I deserve the mess I made, right? I deserve the consequences of the things I've done wrong. So if we just have this word follow, it sounds so passive, right? It sounds like, yeah, it's going to get there. Don't worry. But the word is right. It means to pursue, to, to hunt down. It's not just following me. It's saying that the, the mercy, the steadfast love of Jesus, his goodness is hunting you down. It's pursuing you. And the word is always used in these contexts in your Old Testament of meaning until we capture what we're going after. Now that's a cool image. God says, I'm the good shepherd who loves you so much. I'm going to chase you down in the valley. I'm going to chase you down in your sin and your brokenness until I catch you with my love. Now, notice what it says he's catching you with. Goodness and mercy. Because some of you have been running away when you didn't have to. Or you know people who act like they're running away because they think if God catches me, I'm in trouble. Right? Anybody ever got in trouble with your parents growing up? Right? <laughs> Some of you are eyeballing each other multiple generations. All right? <laughs> and you're like, no, no, no. If mom finds out, <laughs> that was always my fear of my brother and I. If mom finds out. And so we'd always throw the other one into it. That was our technique to try to spread the blame out. Right? <laughs> like, if you got caught, you're like, well, you know what he was doing? <laughs> He was doing this. And my mom would be like, well, we'll deal with that in a moment. You're like, dang it. I thought you could just, right? As a pastor, I've met countless people who are running away from the mercy of God. Because they think, oh, if he catches up to me, he's going to find out. He's going to not like me anymore. He's not going to want me anymore. He's going to discipline me. He's going to punish me. And yet what God's word says is that what he is pursuing you with, what he is chasing you down with until he catches you with is not anger or wrath or punishment. He says, no, what he's chasing you with is goodness and mercy and his steadfast love for you. So this is the promise of the good shepherd of Jesus, what he wants to do in your life. He's like, look, I know you're going through difficult times. I know you're a sinner who made your own mess, yet I'm gonna chase you down in all of that in order to bring you my goodness and mercy and love for you. So his steadfast love will pursue, chase me down all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. So I want to look at this word, dwell. And it is the Hebrew word, shabti. So if you're taking notes, S-H-A-B-T-I, shabti. And what it means is to return home. So it's not just saying, oh, I'm going to dwell there. And like, we have this tendency of like, well, David wrote it. 
And he's a man after God's own heart, and he's King David, and look at all the good stuff that he did. Obviously, he's going to get to dwell with God, right? But the word means to return to dwelling or to return back home. So David's saying, I'm going to shop to you. I'm going to return back, meaning sometimes you and I as sheep get lost. By the way, that's why sheep need a shepherd. <laughs> like the reason they need shepherds is because they get lost. They go the wrong way. And the whole point of a shepherd is to protect the flock, to protect the sheep, and to bring them back home. And so David is saying, look, sometimes you're going to get lost. You're going to go in the wrong direction because sheep are dub stubborn animals. And God loves you, and so do I. But sometimes, guess what? You and I are dumb and stubborn and we go our own ways, we make foolish choices, we, we choose sin over the right way and we wander away. And the goodness of Jesus the shepherd is saying, I'm not gonna just let you stay lost. I'm gonna make it so you can return back home and be with me and be with the flock forever. This is a promise for sinners. That you and I, despite no matter how many times we are stubborn or foolish or dumb in our sin and we get lost, the good shepherd says, I'm chasing you down because you're lost. I'm pursuing you I'm with my mercy, with my steadfast love, with my goodness. I'm going to make it so you can come back home and be with me. Now in the gospel reading, there's this wonderful story of a man named Zacchaeus. And I'm sure it's a story many of you know, but there's a few things I want to point out to it because it reminds us of who Jesus is. So in Luke chapter 19, if you have a Bible, there's a few verses I want to look at. Jesus is marching through a city and people and crowds are following him. But this is right before Palm Sunday happens. Right, so there's crowds everywhere. People are loving Jesus. They're celebrating. And it says that Zacchaeus... In verse 3 of Luke 19, was seeking to see who Jesus was. Like a lot of people in the world. He's seeking to see who is Jesus. Who is the shepherd? Who is the savior that Christianity is all about? And so Jesus is there and Zacchaeus is seeking him and he can't because the crowd's in his way and we write a song about how we little man was he, and he right? He'd climb up in a tree and it rhymes and it's wonderful, but it's kind of wrong <laughs> because the reason he had to climb up there is because the crowd didn't like him. The crowd intentionally kept Zacchaeus from getting to Jesus. That's why he had to climb up into a tree to be able to look down and see who is he. Now, the description of Zacchaeus is that he's a chief tax collector, and it says, and he's rich. And it doesn't mean the Bible's against wealth or people being rich, but it's pointing out the reason Zacchaeus got rich is because as a chief tax collector, he betrayed his own people, and he extorted them like crazy to help the Romans. And so in their world, the worst of the worst kinds of sinners were chief tax collectors. And this is why the crowd doesn't like him. To put it a little more bluntly, the crowd doesn't like him because of the way Zacchaeus sins. Now, just a little while ago, I asked you how many of you acknowledge that you're not perfect? And everybody went, yeah, I'm okay with that, right? But here's what we do, just like the crowd, because if you had to ask people in the crowd back then, hey, are you perfect? They all said, no, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I don't obey all the rules and the commands, right? But what the crowd does, or what you and I do, is, well, Zacchaeus, though, his sins are a little worse because they're different. I've, I've noticed this as a pastor and doing over a decade of pastoral counseling with people. Is <laughs> People are like, but I don't struggle with that, so I'm good, right? Like, you pick whatever sins you don't struggle with that other people do. And when we were like, oh, they're like Zacchaeus, they're way worse than me. Someone goes, why? You're all sinners. And you're like, yeah, but I don't sin like that. Like, you can not nod your heads in agreement, but I know you do it. And this is what the crowd is doing to Zacchaeus. You're too way, you're way worse of a sinner, so you can't come to Jesus. 
And then Jesus is going and he's marching through the city and he sees Zacchaeus in the tree. And verse 5 said, Jesus came to the place. He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. Now here's the point. I think sometimes we forget the details of stories that we know too well. A lot of people have a misunderstanding of the story of like it was Zacchaeus that invited Jesus over. But it's actually the opposite. Jesus invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. And he actually doesn't invite himself. He doesn't go like, hey, is it okay with you if I come over? Right? He doesn't ask Zacchaeus, what time is good for you? What, when is it convenient? No, what does Jesus say? He says, hurry up. <laughs> this is happening now. And then he just says, I, I got to stay at your house. For how long? I just, okay, I'll be at your house. How many of you would love a guest like that? There's knocking at your door like, hurry up. Why? Because I'm here. Why are you here? Because I'm going to stay at your house. For how long? I don't know. What are we going to do? I don't know. I'm here. Let's throw a party. Invite some friends over. Just be realistic, y'all. <laughs> Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, if it was Jesus, I'd do it. Okay. But Zacchaeus didn't know who Jesus was yet. Right? The whole point of the story is he's trying to figure it out. So just imagine someone coming up to your house and be like, I'm here. <laughs> How many of you would just be like, okay, and why? Right? Like, what are we doing? No, you can't come in right now. How many of you scramble to make your house look like a magazine cover before guests come over? And you'd be absolutely terrified if they just walked in right now. Like imagine if after church or after Bible class, because you're all staying, I walked up to you and said, hey, we got to go because I'm coming over. How many of you would be thrilled that I did that to you? <laughs> you'd be like, well, what time, Pastor? I'd be like, right now, I'm going to tailgate you all the way there. I'm not going to give you a moment to dust. How many of you would stop liking me in that moment? Just be like, I don't like this pastor. We got to get a new pastor. Well, that's what Jesus is doing to Zacchaeus. He's like, right now it's happening. And here's the beauty of it. Zacchaeus says, hurries down and received him joyfully. And when they, the crowd, the good people, saw it, they all grumbled and said, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And that's the beauty of the gospel. Jesus says, I'm gonna pursue you with my chesed, my steadfast love, so I can chase you down and you can dwell with me and I can dwell with you even though you are a sinner. And the interesting thing about Zacchaeus' name, it means pure or innocent. And if you know the story of Zacchaeus, you know, man, he did not live up to that name. Right? You and I, as followers of Jesus, all have the name Christian upon us, right? Any of you ever want to admit that you don't always live up to that name? Of, right? By the way, the word Christian means to be a little Christ. So how many of you ever feel like you failed at that this week? I, mean, I, just, I, didn't, look, I didn't live up to the name Jesus right now. Yeah, and Zacchaeus, his name means pure and innocent. Everybody knew. Zacchaeus is not pure. <laughs> he's certainly not innocent. That's why he, everybody looks at him and goes, oh, he's a sinner. And you and I, you know, we're Christians, and we all know. And I, don't, I don't live up to that name quite often. I try, but I fail a lot, right? Because, like Zacchaeus, I'm a sinner. What I love about what Jesus says to him, he says, you know, Zacchaeus, come down, for I must stay the greek word for must there is d and it's d-e-i and it literally means it is necessary right it's not just like i i must meaning like you know i really want to right like i i, I really want to be there you know jesus is saying zacchaeus your name means pure and innocent but you in fact are not you're a sinner and because you're a sinner zacchaeus it is necessary that I come be with you. You and I are like Zacchaeus. We're sinners. 
And if you don't believe me, ask the people around you. <laughs> and like the crowd telling Zacchaeus, hey man, you're a sinner. You're not innocent or pure. People will remind you. But just like Zacchaeus, the good shepherd looks at you and calls you by name and says, it is necessary for me to be with you. And at the end of Luke 19, verse 10, Jesus says, here's why. For the Son of Man came to seek, to pursue, to chase, to hunt down and save the lost. Jesus is the good shepherd who says, no, no, no. Yeah, there's a valley of darkness and death. There's evil in the world. There are enemies. There is sin and death and the devil. And you're like Zacchaeus, you and I, we, we are not innocent and pure. We come up short all the time. And the good shepherd says, but my goodness and my mercy and my grace and my steadfast love is gonna hunt you down. It's gonna pursue you and chase you until it gets a hold of you. He's gonna look at you and call you by name just like he did with Zacchaeus and say, it is necessary for me to be in your life and to dwell with you. And the good news is that just as Jesus went to be with Zacchaeus, he comes to be with you and me, so that like the lost sheep we are, we can go back home and dwell with him forever. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you indeed are the good shepherd who gives to us goodness and mercy and that when we stumble and fall like Zacchaeus when we get lost as sheep stubborn and dumb in our sin you pursue us with goodness and steadfast love and you come into our lives to redeem us and save us so that we can dwell with you forever in your name we pray amen